Part 2. All Roads Lead to Pennsylvania. The remainder of May 1863 would be a time of reformation for the Army of Northern Virginia. Robert E. Lee's army was now down a senior corps commander, leaving the stoic, steadfast, South Carolinian James Longstreet, Old Pete as he was nicknamed, as Lee's senior subordinate. Robert E. Lee would tap Richard Old Baldy Yule to lead Stonewall Jackson's former corps. Yule had proved himself an excellent commander in the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 1862, and although no mortal man could replace the now immortalized Jackson, Yule was the next best man for the job at Lee's disposal. Lee would also raise General Ambrose Powell Hill, general of the famed Light Division, to Corps command. Despite being an often sickly man, rumored to spout from a youthful indiscretion resulting in venereal disease, Powell Hill proved himself a capable commander. His forced march from Harper's Ferry at Antietam saved the Confederate right flank from assured destruction. To fill the ranks of his new Third Corps under Hill, Lee would borrow units from Jackson's former command and combine them with Hill's old command, the Light Division. Robert E. Lee would then begin his summer campaigning season with one senior trusted general and two generals new to Corps leadership. The plan was rather simple. Lee would march his troops up the Shenandoah Valley, a natural highway nestled between the Appalachian Mountains to the west and the Blue Ridge to the east. The Southern Cavalry, led by the debonair Jeb Stuart, would provide a screen for the army by guarding the gaps in the mountains. The Army of Northern Virginia, once in Pennsylvania, would follow the Shenandoah, now the Cumberland Valley, to its natural conclusion somewhere near Harrisburg. From there, they could threaten the Pennsylvania capital, or Pittsburgh to the west, or Philadelphia, New York City, or even Washington itself. They would live off of the land. Any supplies, horses, or foodstuffs they requisitioned would be paid for by Confederate script. Lee distributed General Order 72 with strict orders against looting and unaccounted seizure of property by his troops. This was to be, for all intents and purposes, a gentlemanly invasion. Lee's first test on his campaign into the north would not be an engagement of infantry, but rather a cavalry engagement at Brandy Station, a small but vital Virginia Railroad Depot town. As Lee's infantry streamed at the Culpeper, Virginia, Stuart's cavalry was camped around Brandy Station. On June 8th, Stuart prepared and put in a grand review of the Confederate cavalry for General Lee. Allowing Stuart to feed his inflated ego with the review, Lee ordered Stuart across the Rappahannock the next day to raid Union supplies and screen for the rebel infantry. Hearing reports of a large Confederate cavalry force nearby, and under pressure by Hooker to put an end to Stuart's bothersome raids against the Union supply line, Union Cavalry Corps Commander Major General Alfred Pleasanton devised a plan to attack Stuart's men. He divided his troops into two wings, under Brigadier Generals John Buford and David McMurdy Gregg. The Yankee horsemen attacked the morning of June 9th, surprising Stuart. Over 20,000 cavalrymen clashed in the fields and hills around Brandy Station, marking the largest cavalry engagement of the war. Buford attacked first, followed by a flanking attack by Gregg. Charge after charge, followed by countercharge, marked some of the fiercest horseback action seen in American military history. The infamous Jeb Stuart, the man who made his reputation by riding around the Union Army, had been surprised and arguably embarrassed by the Union attack. Though a withdrawal was ordered by the Union that ended the battle, it was by no means an overwhelming Southern victory. The Battle of Brandy Station proved to the Union cavalry that they were indeed a force to be reckoned with. They gained a new confidence in themselves and in their leaders. For the first time in the war, the Union horsemen were able to match their rebel counterparts in skill and determination. This newfound confidence would foreshadow their heroic actions to come in the climax of the campaign later that summer. Standing in the Confederate infantry's way further north in the valley was the Union-held city of Winchester. 
Winchester, Virginia would go on to be the most contested city of the war, changing hands between North and South some 73 times before the conflict's end. It served as an important crossroads and supply post for both armies throughout the war. The man whose task was to seize this important impediment to the South's march northward was General Ewell and his Second Corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. Richard Stoddart Ewell would certainly rise to this occasion. The Union garrison was led by Major General Robert Milroy of the Department of Washington. Milroy's men, totaled at some 7,000, had entrenched and fortified Winchester into what he thought would be an impossible target to seize by any force. In fact, Milroy was so confident in his ability to defend the city that he had blatantly ignored recommendations from Union General-in-Chief Henry Halleck to fall back to defensive positions around Harper's Ferry. Milroy's confidence would be his and Winchester's downfall. On June 13th, Lieutenant General Ewell and his 19,000-man corps made for Winchester. The plan was to divide his force and envelop the flanks of the defenders through a daring series of flank attacks. By June 15th, Milroy's defenses of the city had fallen. Not only had they fallen, but Ewell inflicted some 4,800 casualties upon the Union, many of them being captured. He also had secured a sizable armament of cannons to utilize in the ongoing campaign headed northward, as well as scores of horses and an untold amount of supplies, ammunition, and food. It had been an overwhelming victory for Yule, who was now being touted as the heir and parent to Jackson's legacy by the Southern newspapers. The Second Battle of Winchester had been a complete embarrassment for the Union, with stories of the incredible defeat beginning to cause panic in the North. Lee was headed toward the Mason-Dixon line, and it seemed like he was unstoppable. Robert E. Lee's machinations of a Northern invasion were going according to plan. His confidence in his troops, viewed as invincible veterans, was overwhelming. Lee himself summed up his grand plan as such. The Yankees will be broken down with hunger and hard marching, strung out on a long line and much demoralized when they come into Pennsylvania. I shall throw an overwhelming force on their advance, crush it, follow up the success, drive one corps back on another, and by successive repulses and surprises before they can concentrate, create a panic and virtually destroy the army. Then the war will be over, and we shall achieve the recognition of our independence. Meanwhile, General Hooker had taken notice of his adversary's march north, and began his own preparations for campaign. On June 5th, based on reports by Chief of Staff General Daniel Butterfield, Hooker canceled all approved leaves and furloughs, and instructed his corps commanders to prepare his troops to march. Despite the battles of Brandy Station and Winchester, Hooker was still oblivious to Lee's ultimate goal. Confederate cavalry under Jeb Stuart had succeeded in screening the moving rebels through the Shenandoah Valley. Hooker, ever focused on Richmond, pitched the idea to President Abraham Lincoln to strike at Richmond in Lee's absence. Lincoln, however, sternly reminded Hooker that Lee's army and the South's ability to wage war not Richmond, should be the Army of the Potomac's true objective. On June 14th, the Federal Army finally departed Fredericksburg and headed for Manassas Junction. While the infantry was on the move, Pleasanton's cavalry began heading to the Mountain Gaps, where their rebel counterparts were providing effective screening for the Army of Northern Virginia. Despite several intense clashes at Audi, Middleburg and Upperville, the Confederate cavalry screen remained intact and accomplished their goal. After defending the mountain gaps and helping to hide Lee's moving army, Jeb Stuart, perhaps seeking redemption for his tarnished reputation at Brandy Station, began the most controversial actions of his storied cavalry career. Having rode around the Union Army once already during the Peninsula Campaign, on June 22nd, Stuart embarked once again on a ride that was sure to strike terror in his enemy and secure much-needed supplies. 
Stuart, however, would leave Robert E. Lee's forces deaf and blind within enemy territory. On June 15th, Ewell's Corps, the vanguard of Lee's army, crossed the Potomac River into Maryland near Williamsport. The crossing of Confederate soldiers onto what many considered to be Union soil sent a shockwave of terror throughout the Union states. President Lincoln issued an emergency proclamation for 100,000 troops to help repel the Southern invaders. Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin called for 50,000 volunteers at the state level to serve as volunteer militia. Only 7,000 would answer the call. The highly populated, industrialized cities of Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, and the Pennsylvania capital of Harrisburg were all considered potential targets by the rebel invaders, and each city began preparing defenses in anticipation of a southern assault. Thousands of refugees fled from south-central Pennsylvania to places north and east. Untold amounts of supplies, valuables, shoes, mercantile items, and family heirlooms were loaded up and sent elsewhere for safekeeping. The emergency of 1863, as it came to be called, had created a panic in northern states and struck terror into the citizens of Pennsylvania. During Lee's invasion of the North in 1862, federal resistance at Harper's Ferry had caused an unexpected delay. This time, however, in 1863, Robert E. Lee chose to ignore Harper's Ferry altogether. However, Union General Joseph Hooker, operating under orders from General-in-Chief Henry Halleck to remain in a position where he could defend both Washington and Harper's Ferry, began insisting upon receiving reinforcements. To compound the Union issues, many soldiers' enlistments were due to expire very shortly. Harper's Ferry would soon be Hooker's undoing. Hooker didn't learn that Lee had crossed the Potomac with his forces until June 25, 1863. Hooker then ordered a concentration of his army around Middletown and Frederick, Maryland. The incredible defeat at Chancellorsville, as well as his want for more reinforcements, gave Hooker pause for a more aggressive pursuit of his southern counterpart. Meanwhile, around that same time, Robert E. Lee had finally reached his planned destination, the Mason-Dixon Line, and the fertile, untouched by war, farm fields, and bounty of Pennsylvania. <laughs>